Hi folks, welcome back. Today I want to take a look at a paper that goes over WebAssembly. Now this paper was published at PLDI a couple of years ago and the authors are from Google, Mozilla, Apple and Microsoft. So you can see that WebAssembly is something that has the backing of all the large tech companies. This paper goes over the core design principles and motivation for WebAssembly and explains how it's different from other currently popular bytecode formats. What is WebAssembly? It is a portable low-level instruction set or a low-level bytecode and it is abstract in that it is not tied to any specific hardware model but is compiled down to a specific hardware architecture. Notably, it is now supported in all the major browsers. And as we will see, one of its core design principles is to be formally verifiable and have a formally specified semantics right from the outset. This is in stark contrast to pretty much every other popular bytecode instruction format like the JVM or the .NET uh, intermediate language, which do not have formally specified semantics and have not been formally proven to be sound. What are the design goals? When we're designing a new low-level instruction set, first of all, we want it to be safe. We want it to be memory safe in the sense that program errors should not be able to compromise user data or system state. So for example, you should not be able to have a buffer overrun attack. We also want it to be fast and efficiently and quickly compilable to native instructions. We want it to be universal and portable in the sense that the programming model of the instruction set should not be tied to that of a specific language, but should be generic enough to support many different programming paradigms. And of course, we want it to be portable because we want this to run on browsers that run on different architectures, different machines, and so on. And lastly, since this code is shipped over the web, over the network, size is definitely a consideration and we want a representation that is compact. So let's get right into the instruction set and see what it looks like. The basic unit of shipping code and encapsulating code in WebAssembly is called a module. And a module is what contains functions and global variables, local variables, tables and a memory specific to that module. Note that all the definitions inside a module are not visible externally, but only the ones that are explicitly exported. Modules in turn can import definitions that have been exported by other modules. And when you look inside a module, the code inside a module consists of functions and functions just as you would expect are typed, they take parameters and return some value. Functions can, of course, call each other. They can call each other recursively, but like some functional programming languages, they are not first-class entities. You cannot take functions as parameters or return them as values. Note that the call stack is not exposed at all. So there is no way for even a malicious instruction to view or corrupt the call stack, which eliminates a whole class of stack smashing attacks. Now let's look at the instructions themselves. WebAssembly is an abstract stack machine. This means that the instructions operate on the contents of the stack. So for example, when you have an add instruction that assumes that there are two integers on the stack and the add instruction will add those two integers on the top of the stack and replace them with the sum. And this choice was explicitly made because stack-based instruction formats are more compact than register-based instruction formats because 
the operands are implicit. You don't have to use up space when encoding an instruction to specify the operands like you have to do with a register-based format. In terms of data types, WebAssembly has only four basic data types. Two types of integers, 32-bit and 64-bit integers, and two types for floats. Again, 32-bit floats and 64-bit floats. And here's a high-level look at the instruction set itself. You have unary operations that can do things like negate or take the absolute value. You have binary operations for adding, subtracting, multiplication, and so on, as well as for the Boolean operators of AND or OR. You have operators that test for values, things like whether two values are equal or less than or greater than each other. And you have instructions to get and set local variables, get and set global variables. And finally, of course, you have control flow instructions, which in WebAssembly are very special and different from control flow instructions in other low-level bytecode formats. So you have instructions like looping and if, and you have blocks of code. And this is where WebAssembly departs significantly from other low-level bytecode instruction formats in that all the control flow instructions are strictly structured. There is no arbitrary branching. This makes it very close to actually a high-level language without any arbitrary go-tos. All the branches can only branch to structured constructs like the beginning or the end of a loop or the beginning or the end of a block. Also, all these control flow instructions like having a block or a loop or an if must be properly nested in order to be valid. This is a very crucial design point because this is what enables WebAssembly to have a type checker that can validate a given string of WebAssembly code in one linear pass. This is very different, for example, from Java bytecode where you can have arbitrary branching and then the JVM has to do a fairly expensive iterative control flow verification phase to make sure that the types on the stack line up with the instructions that expect values of certain types on the stack. So for example, in Java bytecode, if you have an add instruction, how do you know that at that point, the top of the stack will contain two int values that can be added? That is hard to prove in the presence of arbitrary branching. But with these kinds of structured control flow and branching constructs, that becomes a very simple one pass check. You can statically determine by looking at the WebAssembly code, the types of the values on the stack at every point. The next big notable thing about WebAssembly is that it has been designed from the very start with formal verification in mind. So the authors have formally specified the semantics of all these instructions and have formally proven type safety and type soundness proofs for the instruction set. In fact, they have even gone one step further and in another paper, they have mechanized this proof. So the proof of soundness and of safety has been expressed in an automatic theorem checker and has been proved by it. This is a really big deal because none of the other popular bytecode formats have this level of formal verification. And this actually makes WebAssembly very, very appealing for safety critical systems. That was a general look at WebAssembly. It is a general instruction set. However, it did get created in the context of the web. Currently, it is now a web consortium spec. It stands at version 1.0. All the major browsers have support for it and you can load it through a JavaScript API. So most of the major compilers for languages like C and C++ and Go and Rust now have a WebAssembly target. So you can compile those languages into WebAssembly. 
you can ship that WebAssembly over the web and load it and execute it in your browser. This is what enables demos like playing Doom inside the browser because they took the code for Doom, the C and C++ code, and compiled it to WebAssembly and ran it in the browser. Here are a few benchmarks that compare the execution times of WebAssembly with the execution time of their native code counterparts. And you can see that for a lot of benchmarks, WebAssembly is actually faster. And then for a few of them, it's much slower. But note that the compilation time, this orange bar, which is the time it takes for the WebAssembly compiler to go from WebAssembly to native code of the platform on which it's running, that time is actually very small compared to the total execution time, which shows that it can be compiled and efficiently executed very quickly. We also see that going with the design choice of having a stack-based instruction set pays off in terms of compactness. This is a graph of native code size versus WebAssembly code size. And this black line is a slope of one so if you fall along that, the two are the same. If you fall below that, that means that WebAssembly code is more compact than native code. And for the most part, we see that, yes, WebAssembly code is much more compact than native code. So like I said, the WebAssembly spec is currently at version 1. It already has compiler support for most of the popular low-level languages like C and C++ and Rust and so on. In the future, the WebAssembly authors would like to also support higher level languages. And for that, you need support for things like exceptions and threads and SIMD instructions. But most notably, you need some support for garbage collection. And that's something they're working on. So that was a quick look at the design and motivation of WebAssembly as a portable low-level instruction set. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.